we met up with Stephen Stahl and found something we all agree on. Three reasons to use an MAOI. Welcome to the Carlite Psychiatry Podcast, keeping psychiatry honest since 2003. I'm Chris Aiken, the Editor-in-Chief of the Carlite Psychiatry Report. And I'm Kelly Newsom, a psychiatric NP and a dedicated reader of every issue. Stephen Stahl isn't known as a promoter of generic drugs. Between 2014 and 2020, Stahl was the top earner on OpenPayments.com, bringing in $8.6 million in speaking and consulting fees over those six years, more than half of which was from Takeda, maker of Trintelix. So we were surprised to find Stahl speaking on a long-forgotten generic this year at the APA meeting in San Francisco. Stahl is writing a book on lithium. He just finished one on clozapine, and he hosted a seminar at the conference whose wordy title is A Call to Action. If you are a psychiatrist, you need to know how to prescribe monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Guide for MAOIs so an effective treatment option is not lost. Today, we're going to bring you some highlights from his talk. MAOIs are known as a second or third line option for treatment resistant depression. But Stahl pointed out their benefits in treatment resistant cases are not backed by the kind of gold standard science we have for meds like aripiprazole. He did highlight a randomized double blind crossover trial from 1993 that compared to the MAOI phenylzine with the tricyclic imipramine in 89 patients with chronic, non-melancholic, treatment-resistant depression. The study was done by one of the founders of psychopharmacology, Donald Klein, and Jonathan Stewart, who was one of the presenters at the talk. This was a much-talked-about study in the 1990s, so it was good to see it back in the slide deck. The patients were not truly treatment-resistant, as they had failed just one antidepressant, not two. That's a common lapse in these kind of trials. What they did was treat all of the patients with either the MAOI phenylzine or the tricyclic imipramine. Then they took those who did not respond to the antidepressant and switched them randomly to the other antidepressant. So the imipramine failures got to try phenylzine and vice versa. In the end, switches to phenylzine looked more promising with response rates of 67% versus 41% when imipramine was the second trial. Like most studies, this one has problems, and the problem here helps us understand when to use MAOIs. Most of these patients, 80% of them, had atypical features, and none had melancholic features. Atypical depression is known to respond better to MAOIs, while melancholic features favor a tricyclic approach. The features are easy to remember if you think of them as opposite. Atypical equals high appetite. Melancholic, low appetite. Atypical, oversleeping. Melancholic, early morning awakening. Atypical, reactive mood with rejection sensitivity. A mood that tends to worsen as the day goes on and stress builds up. Melancholic equals non-reactive mood that is worse in the morning. Patients often wake up with a sense of nameless dread. Their mood is distinct from normal human sadness in a way that puzzles the patient as they try to put into words. My insides have died. My heart has turned to concrete. They feel empty, despondent, and full of despair. Finally, there's the psychomotor part. Here they are not exactly opposite, but they are different. In atypical depression, ask about lead and paralysis. Do your arms or legs feel heavy as if they are pulled down by lead weights? In melancholic depression, the motor changes are more visible. They are either lifeless and slowed down, or so agitated it looks like they have akathisia. Bottom line, the study favored the MAOI, but had they focused on melancholic patients, things may have gone the other way. And that is about the best study we have for MAOIs in kind of treatment-resistant depression. It is small, the patients were not truly treatment-resistant, and there was no placebo control. And the population was biased in favor of the MAOI. Outside of that, Stahl is right. The evidence for MAOIs in treatment-resistant depression is surprisingly anecdotal. 
a fancy term for storytelling by experts. And here are some of those stories. In 1985, psychiatrists at Yale gave the MAOI trenylcypramine to 12 patients on the inpatient unit who were genuinely treatment resistant, having failed at least two antidepressants and a course of lithium. They were kept on the lithium, and the MAOI tranylcypramine was added. Eight of the 12 had a meaningful recovery, as judged by a blinded raider. In 2020, we interviewed Joe Goldberg, who runs a consultation practice for treatment-resistant depression in New York. We asked Dr. Goldberg what treatments he uses for highly treatment-resistant cases, the ones who have failed three to five antidepressants and psychotherapy. Joe named ECT, ketamine, pramipexol, and high-dose MAOIs as his go-to drugs. There are case reports of successful treatment of treatment-resistant depression with a high-dose MAOI, mainly tranylcypramine, at doses of 90 to 120 milligrams a day. But blood pressure often becomes a limiting factor in this dose range, not hypertension, which is the dangerous side effect with MAOIs, but hypotension. Yes, these drugs can go both ways and make blood pressure drop, in which case, Support stockings is a good first-line intervention. But it is not all good news for MAOIs in treatment-resistant depression. In 2007, researchers from the Netherlands tested a trial of phenylzine against lithium augmentation in 28 elderly patients with treatment-resistant depression. This study was randomized, and the results favored lithium which brought one in three patients to remission, compared to zero, that's right, zero, for those who switched to the MAOI. This was in the elderly population, and you know, we have in the report published data about a superior response for elderly depression with lithium. So don't rule it out. We often avoid it in the elderly because of the medical risk with lithium, but for the right patient, it could be life-changing. The latest data is a 2018 study from Brazil that tested a risky MAOI tricyclic combination in 31 patients who failed to respond to ECT. An impressive 80% of the patients responded within three months. We have to be skeptical of numbers like that in an open-label study. For all we know, lots of other researchers tried this without success, and these were the lucky ones who published. Or maybe these patients briefly perked up when an expert came in with a cutting-edge treatment. But to their credit, the researchers did follow most of the patients for another nine years, and none of them slipped back into depression. So even if it was a placebo, it wasn't a flash in the pan. Nine years. Wow, you heard that right. That risky combination was tranylcypramine plus the tricyclic amipramine. For years, tricyclics have been on the do not use page of the MAOI manual. But recent papers suggest that tricyclics can be used without problems. Or at least, if there are problems, they are too rare to show up in the 1 or 200 patients where we have these reports. The risk we are worried about here is serotonin syndrome, something that is theoretically possible with any combination of a serotonergic medication, like SSRIs and an SNRI. But serotonin syndrome is unfortunately much more common and more deadly when one of those serotonergic meds is an irreversible inhibitor at the enzymes that break down serotonin. In other words, an MAOI. This risk has led to fears of combining MAOIs with any psychiatric meds, and that is one reason they are neglected. Most of the patients who are candidates for an MAOI are already taking multiple meds. The risk here is really with serotonergic medications, not with noradrenergics or dopaminergics, although dopaminergics can raise blood pressure on an MAOI. Dr. Stahl spent a lot of the talk dispelling these myths about drug interactions. He said that most of the tricyclic antidepressants can be used with caution with an MAOI except for two, amipramine and clomipramine, as those two have strong serotonergic reuptake inhibition. In our book, 
prescribing psychotropics, we are a little more conservative. We recommend sticking with the least serotonergic tricyclics if you're going to use this strategy. And those are disipramine, trimipramine, and doxepin, also called Silenor, which is mainly used for insomnia. But both of us agree on using with caution, which means monitoring blood pressure and only using it when the benefits outweigh the risk. In other words, the depression is severe and safer options have not worked. Although amitriptyline was used in that recent case series, it does have mild serotonergic properties, so we're not ready to endorse it yet when there are safer tricyclics to draw from. We also agree with Stahl that bupropion, metazapine, and trazodone are relatively safe in combination with MAOIs. And while Dr. Stahl opened up the door for those antidepressant combinations, he also closed the door on a few psychotropics that have serotonergic effects but are not antidepressants. These should be avoided with MAOIs. Two antipsychotics, ziprazidone, geodon, and the new one, lumateperone, caplita. Also the new med, avuliti. Even though bupropion, which is part of avuliti, is okay, the dextromethorphan component, that cough medicine, has mild serotonergic effects. Now, some very conservative authors would add buspirone, lithium, and ketamine to that list as they have serotonergic effects as well. But the risk of serotonin syndrome is exceedingly rare with these, and Stahl put them in the use with caution category. Another controversial combination is the stimulant MAOI. Here, the risk is more of hypertension. Stimulants, particularly amphetamines, have weak serotonergic effects, so That is possible serotonin syndrome, but there are no cases of serotonin syndrome on them on PubMed. Some experts use this dangerous MAOI stimulant combo as a last resort in treatment-resistant depression. And the same precautions apply here as they do with the tricyclics. Stahl made a useful distinction, which is that if you're going to tread this rocky path, the methylphenidates are safer than the amphetamines. We agree. After drug interactions, the other reason people avoid this renowned antidepressant class is the MAOI diet. No one wants a case of hypertensive crisis on their hands because their patient could not resist a tyramine-rich chunk of aged cheese. Dr. Stahl and Stewart pointed to the updated MAOI diet, which is based on modern post-2000 methods of measuring tyramine and is much more liberal and easy to follow than the stodgy old version. Their dietary guidelines were right in line with the ones we reviewed in our March 20th podcast. It's also on page 142 of Prescribing Psychotropics. In this podcast, we've covered four reasons to use an MAOI. Let's recap. One, atypical depression. Two, treatment-resistant depression, three, social anxiety disorder, and possibly panic disorder. This podcast is not a full MAOI prescribing guide. Turn to our July 2018 online issue for that, but we will round it out with that most important question, which MAOI to start with? There are four in the US and the choice matters, so let's get to know them. One, phenylzine. Think of this one as the sleeper. Fatigue is the main side effect. And you can remember that by its brand name, Nardil, which sounds like narcolepsy. It also causes more weight gain and sexual dysfunction than the others. And unlike its competitor, trinylcypramine, it can cause vitamin B6 deficiency. Besides its MAOI base, phenylzine produces a metabolite with GABAergic properties, which may be why this one is the best studied MAOI in social anxiety disorder. Stahl called it a secret weapon there. Actually, he called it bitchin', and we agree. In multiple controlled trials, phenylzine has about double the the effect size in social anxiety as an SSRI. Phenylzine also has small studies in panic disorder. And Stahl gave it the bitchin' status for anxious depression. 
an anecdote that binds some support in small controlled trials from the 1970s. The secret of the day. If you leave here, don't know anything else. If you're going to use them, because I got a great secret here. They are bitching drugs for social anxiety. The second MAOI is tranalcipramine, brand name Parnate, the upper. This one is more of an activating drug, as it has dopaminergic properties, so some call it a triple reuptake inhibitor affecting serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Unless your patient has insomnia, tranalcipramine is the MAOI to start with, if only to spare them the weight gain, fatigue, and sexual dysfunction from the phenylzine. But there is a catch. Tranalcipramine is the most expensive of these generic MAOIs. These meds are prescribed so rarely, even in the populations that need them most, like this study from Complicated Chronic Depression in a Public Mental Health Center, only 1 in 1,000 take an MAOI. That rate is breathtakingly small. And that has caused supply and demand bottlenecks that jack the price up. Those are the top two. To recap, phenylzine for depression with anxiety disorders and tranalcipramine for its favorable side effects. Otherwise, there is no difference in efficacy. And that has been tested in a head-to-head study. The third MAOI is isocarboxazide, Marplan. This one is third line. Why? There aren't as many studies with it, so we just don't know how it stacks up in treatment-resistant depression. The same limitation holds true with the fourth and final MAOI, selegiline, also known by its brand name in the patch form, MSAM. Many are drawn to this patch because it lacks food interactions, at least in the low dose of 6 mg a day. MSAM also has the luster of a recently branded med. In other words, there's a myth that it is better tolerated. But from experience, I can tell you there is little difference in the tolerability of MSAM and tranalcipramine. Both are slightly activating, and that's about the only side effect I've seen on either of them although MSAM patch does cause a skin irritation in most patients. You can treat it with hydrocortisone cream. And tranalcipramine does tend to cause hypotension, low blood pressure at high doses. Dr. Stahl barely mentioned MSAM, and he did not endorse it for the same reasons that I would steer away from it. First, MAOIs have a dose-dependent response. That's unique. Not every antidepressant has that. In fact, most don't. So if you're moving in the MAOI direction, you're probably dealing with a difficult-to-treat depression that is going to need the higher dose. So while MSAM is friendly to start out with, there are no food restrictions at the 6 milligrams, Most patients need to march up to the 9 to 12 milligrams level where they're going to need to watch out for that dietary tyramine. Second problem, MSAM has no studies in treatment-resistant depression, which is usually why you turn to an MAOI. Now, the oral version, oral selegiline, does have those studies, but only in high doses, like 30 to 60 milligrams a day which when we convert to the patch is equivalent to about 9 to 18 milligrams a day of MSAM. So the patch might work. You know, you can get up to 12 milligrams a day with the patch. It doesn't go to 18, but it's also expensive and we just don't have the evidence to sit on there. At the Carlat Report, we do have a bias. We try to cover stories that aren't getting covered by the mainstream psychiatric press. Those unsponsored wonders like Lightbox and ECT, exercise and psychotherapy, lithium, clozapine, and the MAOIs. We were pleased to see Dr. Stahl join the crusade, and we asked him what drew him in. Here's what he said. 
the APA Education Committee asked me to put together a session on MAOIs. I see it as a way to give back to the meeting, and there will be future sessions on old meds like lithium and clozapine. There was no honorarium, and he paid his own travel and registration. These days, it's rare to see a psychiatrist of stall stature at the APA meeting, and pharmaceutical funding, or lack thereof, is part of the reason. In 2008, the APA cut ties with the pharmaceutical industry at their conference. Before that, the highlight of every meeting was the evening dinner symposium, where top researchers gave talks as audiences of over a thousand dined on three course meals. The industry paid for the setup, but the APA chose the speakers independently. At least, that's how it was supposed to be. In reality, I've heard of pressures at such meetings to, say, feature a talk about pain because the makers of Cymbalta are funding it. But on the positive side, it incentivized people to submit their best talks and drew more talent in for talks in the daytime lifting the quality of the conference overall, because everybody wanted to be a speaker at that dinner symposium. Now, sadly, as the money dried up, so did the experts. Stahl is one of the last ones standing. But we can turn this around. I'm going to submit a talk for next year's APA meeting, and if you have an area of expertise, I hope you will too. We'll be true to the original Hippocratic Oath, where young physicians pledged to teach the art of medicine without reward or payment. Stahl may have spoken without honorarium, but he was not without disclosures. And among the three dozen companies that reported relationships, one stood out to us that is worth mentioning. He is the chief medical officer at NeuroWell, a Florida-based pharmaceutical company that is developing an extended-released MAOI and a combination MAOI and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And now for the study of the day, reporting of harms in clinical trials of esketamine and depression, a systematic review by Tangi de la Portelier and colleagues from the journal Psychological Medicine. To understand this study, you'll need to know about two pivotal events in clinical research from the 1990s, the development of the Consort Guide in 1996 and clinicaltrials.gov a year later. Before the 90s was kind of the wild west of clinical trials. Try reading some of those early papers. Often it is unclear how the treatments were delivered, the diagnoses were made, and the ratings were assessed. Then, in 1996, 30 scientists came together to create the consort guides, basically laid out standards for conducting and reporting on trials that are with us today. A year later, in 1997, the National Institutes of Health launched clinicaltrials.gov, a public registry of clinical trials. The registry started as a way to improve access to investigational drugs for patients with terminal and rare illnesses like HIV and cancer, but it grew into a way to keep research honest. When trials are registered there in advance, researchers can't hide negative results or move the goalposts to fit the data as the study progresses. The registry also gives everyone a chance to look at the raw data, which is what the investigators in today's study did for 10 trials of S-ketamine. Using the consort guides as a standard, they compared this raw data on clinicaltrials.gov to the published studies for this anesthetic-turned-antidepressant. And here's what they found. Only about 40% of adverse effects in the raw data were reported in the published studies, including 179 serious adverse effects. Here's a sampling of some of those undisclosed serious adverse events. Delirium, confusion, depression, two suicide attempts, one completed suicide, as well as medical events like cerebral hemorrhage, hypertensive crisis, and symptoms of inflammatory renal and urinary disease. The studies largely missed on the consort standards, failing to write down how they decided if an adverse event was related to the drug or not. On a positive note, 
the long-term open-label study of esketamine, which was intended to detect adverse events, had the highest consort rating. Now, why did they skip like this on the data? Well, one possibility is that they only reported adverse events at the start of the treatment. But really, that's not a good excuse for this, especially when most of the unreported events occurred in the medication arm. And this is not to say that all of those were side effects to esketamine. They were just events that happened in the trial. All that we're saying here is that the data was missing. Esketamine was fast-tracked through FDA approval, allowing it to enter the market without the usual high standards that we're accustomed to with a new medication. Those standards, it now seems, are even lower than what we knew. Dr. A can post a study a day on his LinkedIn and Twitter feed, The Daily Psych at Chris Aiken, MD. Earn CME for this podcast through the link in the show notes. Want more? Try one of our online journals in special editions of Child, Addiction, Geriatric, Hospital Psych, and for the Generalist, our flagship report. Thanks for watching. Hit subscribe if you enjoyed this content. And to earn CMEs for listening, head on over to thecarletreport.com slash podcast.